is God's word. Matthew 6 from verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for, wh- for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for you, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. May the Lord bless these readings of his word to us. Friends, imagine if God said to us, My people, you can pray for one thing and for only one thing, but whatever it is you ask for, I will give you. Yes, what you request, you will receive. How would we respond? What would we pray for? We have only one request, no more, but whatever we ask for will definitely be granted to us. What would we ask for? Well, there may well be quite a variety of answers, but I imagine many would pray for things like these, that there would be a worldwide peace, as we reflect upon the horrors of the Middle East and Ukraine, that there would be no more suffering, that there would be an end to sickness and disease, and that our world would be rid of discrimination and sectarianism. Others would probably pray more selfishly that they would win the lottery or that they would inherit great wealth. These are the sorts of things most people dream of. And so they would put them at the top of their prayer list if they had only one thing to pray for. What about you today? If you were given one thing you could pray for and you knew it would be granted, what would you ask for? In the second line of this prayer, the Lord Jesus actually tells you and me what our top prayer request should be every single day. Our master is saying to us, this should be your chief passion in life. This should be your top priority for your God's name to be hallowed. As we reflect on this first prayer request of the Lord's Prayer, There are two main matters I'd like us to consider. Let us think first of all about the burden of this prayer. What is the real concern that we're to have here as we pray this? As we ask our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, what are we really asking for? Well, we're not simply praying that people won't blaspheme. We're not merely asking that folk won't take the Lord's name in vain, as so many do, sadly. We're praying for something much, much more radical and much more far-reaching because we're praying that the living and true God will be praised and worshipped throughout the nations of the world. Yes, we're asking that the God of heaven will be honoured and revered increasingly by people throughout the earth. This is what we're really asking for here. And so this is to be our great burden as you and I pray each day. Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. 
we are to long that all creatures across the globe will acknowledge and acclaim their creator in his glory and goodness and grace. That multitudes and millions will stop suppressing, will stop suppressing the truth of the creator and acknowledge him and praise him. We're to want all creation to bow down and bless the maker of heaven and earth. We're to desire passionately that every single person will give our God the glory due to his name. Friends, this is the burden of this prayer. The great concern that's to be gripping your heart and mine as we pray, hallowed be your name. And Jesus says here that this is where true prayer begins with a real burden for God's honour and glory. Therefore, dear Christian friends, this is where our praying each day should begin. This should be our first and most earnest prayer request day by day. When we look at God's people in the scriptures, we see that this is exactly how they prayed. For this was their great passion in life. For people everywhere to praise the great Jehovah, the true and living God. This was their burning desire for their God to be increasingly glorified. And they longed for the beauty of their God's character to be <coughs> celebrated. They were passionate for his wonderful works to be praised. Just look at these songs that God's given us. Look at the psalmists, filled and inspired with the spirit, David burst into song in psalm 34 i will extol the lord at all times his praise will always be on my lips glorify the lord with me let us exalt his name together in psalm 66 we were singing the songwriter's cry of celebration which rings out shout with joy to god all the earth sing the glory of his name make his praise glorious in Psalm 67, the fervency for God to be glorified across the globe, it's totally transparent. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Psalm 113 declares, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Again in Psalm 117, David sang out loud words of earnest exhortation. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. And this was the overriding concern of God's faithful people in the Old Testament, for their sovereign God to be honoured across the earth. It was also top priority for Christ's people in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul's burning desire for God to be glorified, it comes across in all of his letters. In Romans chapter 11, verse 36, Paul wrote these words of worship about God. From him, from God, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And then to young Timothy, Paul wrote, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. And at the end of his letter, Jude penned these mighty words. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. It's obvious that everybody in the Bible who walked with God was passionate about his praise and had hearts that yearned for people across the globe to sing his glories. And of course, this was true most of all for one man, above all others, for Jesus Christ himself. In John chapter 12, Jesus was contemplating his death. And as Jesus faced the horror of hell upon Calvary's cross, it is highly, highly significant and striking what Jesus prayed for. In John 12, verse 28, God's Son prayed simply and profoundly, Father, glorify your name. Isn't that so telling? As Jesus contemplated the curse of the cross, his chief concern was not his own suffering, 
his primary burden was still for his father to be glorified. That was of paramount importance for him. My Christian friend, this is to be your burning desire as well, and mine. This must be your chief concern in life, that our Heavenly Father's name is increasingly glorified and honoured and magnified. Of course, it's right for you and me to be burdened concerning our own needs and for those needs of our family and friends. And it's totally proper for us to be deeply burdened for the lost to be saved, especially those close to us. But the overriding passion of our hearts is to be that our loving God and Father is worshipped and praised by all people throughout the earth because he's totally worthy of all worship. And so this is exactly what he deserves. And therefore I ask you, on this Lord's Day, is your heart pulsating with passion for Jesus Christ's name to be glorified across the globe? Does this desire dominate your life? Are you deeply grieved that his name is so dishonoured and despised by so many people across the earth? Does it trouble your soul that the vast majority of mankind treat our God so disgracefully and shamefully in everyday life and through the media? The name of our Saviour is reviled instead of being revered. Surely that fills you and me with sorrow. Christian friend, each day you are to pray believingly and earnestly, O Father in heaven, May your name be glorified in our city and in our nation and by peoples in all places throughout the world. This is to be at the top of your prayer list, even in the midst of your own personal trials. Your first and foremost passion is to be for the honour of our Heavenly Father, that blasphemers will be transformed by the gospel into worshippers, that godless sinners will will be convicted and converted and changed into God-glorifying saints. And that those who are already born of the Spirit will be increasingly sanctified to reflect more and more the likeness of our radiant Redeemer. All for God's greater glory. Christian friend, if this isn't really a big issue in your life, you need to recognise your sin here and to confess this to our God. If our God's glory isn't a big deal to you, you need to be repentant and to ask God to forgive you and to fill you with a holy zeal for his glory. Millions of our fellow men today are taken up with all sorts of worldly glamour and glory concerning the rich and the famous and the successful, celebrities of all sorts, crave the attention and adulation of the watching world. Film stars crave the glitz and glory of winning awards and Oscars. Pop stars crave the continued devotion of their fans. Sports stars revel in the sweetness of their success and in the glory of being champions and in the adulation of their supporters. Many such stars are very talented and their achievements are admirable. But as Christ's people, we surely see the shallowness and shortness of such earthly glory. Don't we recognise how fleeting it all is? It contrasts so starkly with our God's eternal glory. The glory of our Heavenly Father is an entirely different league altogether in its breadth and beauty and magnitude and magnificence. Our God is to be praised for all eternity. And he is wholly deserving of such glory. Our God is unique in the perfection of his person and in the wonder of his works. My friend, may this be the deepest burden on your heart by the work of the Spirit. That your heavenly Father will be honoured. That God, your Saviour, will be glorified. That Father, Son and Spirit will be worshipped increasingly across the world. Well, having thought about the burden of this prayer... We come secondly and lastly to think about the benefits of this prayer. And there are three main benefits of having this prayer request uppermost in your heart day by day. 
And these are three ways in which you and I are helped as Christians as we pray daily for our Heavenly Father to be glorified. First of all, this prayer corrects us. This prayer keeps us at the very start of our praying from wrong attitudes in prayer. Because of our sinful natures, we're naturally very self-centered. Because of our twisted hearts, we quickly and easily get wrapped up in ourselves. And this preoccupation with ourselves can dominate our prayers. And we live in a very sick and broken society, which constantly encourages us to focus on ourselves and to feed our selfishness. Pamper and please yourself. Look after number one. Seek after your own glory and what is good for you. That is the miserable but mesmerizing message of our Western world. Well, these words, hallowed be your name, are so beneficial. For as we think about them and pray them from our hearts, they help us to take our eyes off ourselves. They enable us to have the proper perspective of who we are as tiny, fallen, undeserving creatures and of who God is as the all-deserving, almighty creator. These words place God back at the centre. These words cause us to bow before the living and true God, to look upwards and to recognise his infinite glory and to worship him. Friends, these words correct our innate selfishness and they help to silence our many self-centred prayers. Sometimes, if not often, we rush into God's presence with our requests for ourselves and for others without focusing on the glory of the Lord at all. We can launch into prayer, O oh, Heavenly Father, here's what's needed, without being concerned about our God himself and his glory. Here we have a divinely given help divinely given instruction to help us focus on those matters that are upmost important in prayer. Indeed, as we focus upon our Father in heaven, reflecting upon his grace and greatness, and then as we pray for his wonderful name to be lifted up and extolled, this should help the rest of our praying to be more God-centered. And so all of our requests are to be put into this context that our God is to be glorified in all that we ask for. Our Heavenly Father, may you be greatly honoured. That is my top request and my chief concern. I also bring you my other requests, but I'm asking for these other things only insofar as they are for your honour and glory as well. My brothers and sisters, if we could come to God every time with an eye on God's glory, we would perhaps discard some of our requests, recognising them as only selfish for our own glory. And so putting God's glory first in prayer is a great corrective. It steers us away from being preoccupied with ourselves and our own desires. A second benefit of praying for our Heavenly Father's glory is that it also comforts us for praying first and foremost for our God to be glorified helps us to cope with life's disappointments and sorrows. In the midst of heartbreaking circumstances, we're reminding ourselves that our God and Father can still be honoured in them. For example, what if you've been praying for someone to recover from a serious illness? As time passes, it becomes clear that your request isn't going to be answered or granted. Indeed, instead of recovering from illness, the loved one you've been praying for is taken from you. What are you to pray for next? Of course, we're to pray for our Heavenly Father to help us cope with our loss and to grant us his comfort and counsel. But if we have really learned to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, then our deep grief will be tempered. Yes, yes, we will suffer anguish and a, a deep sense of loss, and our hearts will be sore with sorrow. But we will not be totally overcome, for we can still pray, Heavenly Father, may your name be glorified in this grief that has entered my life. 
in the midst of my heartbreak and sorrow. May your glory be seen. Help me to walk with you through this terrible trial and days of darkness in such a way that you'll be glorified in my life. My brothers and sisters, whether we're in the midst of joy or sorrow, we can still pray, our Father be glorified. When we're filled with gratitude or disappointment, our hearts can always cry out, Heavenly Father, may your name be honoured. What a comfort this is. I'm sure it was a great comfort to Paul and Silas in the prison cell at Philippi. And Christian friends, we have the example of our Saviour's cross itself to teach us a vital lesson. Our God and Father is actually more often glorified in the sorrows and trials of his people than in our times of joy and encouragement. For when was God the Father most glorified in the life of his Son? It was when the Son of God went to the horror of hell on the cross and gave himself to be a substitute for his people. It was when his Son suffered the curse of the cross on our behalf that his Father in heaven was most glorified in Jesus' life. Therefore, my fellow Christians, we should not expect our service for our Saviour to be plain sailing or pain free. And when troubles hit hard, we should pray this prayer. Loving Father in heaven, glorify your name in the midst of all of this trauma. Being able to pray this from your heart will bring you inner strengthening and comfort. Even in times when you're greatly perplexed or in severe pain, our God will bless you with his supernatural peace which passes all our understanding. And so this God-given prayer brings wonderful benefits to his children in Christ. It corrects us, it comforts us, and lastly, it also challenges us. Friends, praying such prayer in the Spirit of Christ is a dynamic process because you and I get pulled into our prayers and God works in our lives in such a way that we actually become part of the answer to our prayers. And so as you and I pray, we're not uninvolved in our praying. No, we can't pray, Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name, without being pulled into the prayer and changed ourselves. Christian friends, how is our God's name hallowed? Our God is honoured and glorified when his people like you and me stand out as different from unbelievers. Our Heavenly Father is honoured when we walk in his spirit and reflect the likeness of his son. And our heavenly father is glorified when we speak in ways which highlight his greatness and goodness. When we tell others who our God is and what he's done in creation and providence and salvation, he is glorified. So God's name being hallowed doesn't simply mean that it's never mentioned in a negative way or blasphemed. Though the name of our God and Father has to be spoken about in positive ways, our lips are to declare our God's complete control and his loving care and his unwavering faithfulness and his infinite wisdom and his perfect righteousness and justice. Unbelievers around you and me need to hear us speak of our Lord with great joy and reverence. They need to see us depending upon and delighting in our Heavenly Father, whatever our circumstances or setbacks. And so God's name being hallowed involves his children in Christ, making known his unsurpassable glory and his astonishing grace. Therefore, as we pray this prayer, we are really committing ourselves to be witnesses for Christ. We're saying to our God, Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name, and use me, Father, to bring honour and glory to your name. And our lips aren't simply to glorify our God in witnessing, they are also to glorify our God in worshipping. We are to be wholehearted in singing his praises each Lord's day and day by day, making music in our hearts to the Lord as we rejoice together in his glory and grace. And so our lips are to bring glory to our God and Father. And so are our lives. Sadly, 
And tragically in the Bible, we often read of God's people dishonouring him by how they were living. At times, their behaviour was disgraceful and led unbelievers to mock God and to take him lightly. Christian friend, what a sobering, terrifying thought that our lives could bring great dishonour to God's name. Think of all the professing Christians throughout Northern Ireland. We're all called to be 100% committed to honouring our God in every area of our lives, both public and private. Yet so often our behaviour is unbecoming of a Christian and our speech is unedifying and our attitudes are ungodly and how we treat others is displeasing and dishonouring to God. My friend, if you pray this prayer from your heart, you must seek to live by the Spirit's enabling in such a way that brings glory to our Heavenly Father. This prayer, what a challenge it brings. In John 17 verse 4, Jesus was able to make an amazing statement. God's Son was just about to go to the cross when he said to his Father, Father, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to say to our Heavenly Father, this should be your own goal, life's goal. The overriding ambition in life should be able to say, as you're taken from this world, our Heavenly Father, I've brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. What a challenge. And so the benefits of really praying this prayer are immense. It corrects us, comforts us, and challenges us. In closing, I want to say that as you pray this prayer, you are asking for something that is an absolute certainty. You're praying for something that without a shadow of a doubt will be fulfilled. You're praying for our God and Father's name to be honoured throughout the earth. Well, when our Saviour, his Son, returns in awesome power and glory, his heavenly Father's name will be fully honoured. Paul assures us of this truth. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul asserts that when our King returns and reappears, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. And that at this stage in redemption history, we still see millions upon millions continue in their foolish, sinful rebellion before our God. But Christian friends, the day's coming when everyone will bow the knee to Christ our King. And on that great and awesome day, the earth will be filled with the glory of our Lord as the waters cover the sea. Therefore, on that last day, everyone, both rebel and saint, will bow before our God and Father in absolute awe. Every rebel will be condemned to eternal punishment in hell, and everyone in Christ, born of the Spirit, will be taken up with their Lord to dwell with him forever in the new heaven and earth. Don't lose sight of what lies ahead, and don't lose sight of your own destiny if you are in Christ today. Don't lose sight of the glory of our God, one day soon, you and I will dwell with our God in his glory. And in Christ, we ourselves will be glorified in his very presence. Hallelujah. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Well, let us join in prayer together.